Hey everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Today we are going to deal with some complicated issues. Uh, if you've ever wrestled with if you're actually chosen by Jesus or not, if you're actually going to make it or not, uh, you should probably stick around and listen to this episode. Today we are looking at Luke chapter 13, and I always get excited when I find a thread, and it seems like the thread for Luke 13, it actually kind of follows up on the end of chapter 12, and is kind of talking about this idea of being prepared, because judgment comes when nobody expects it, and the only way to be prepared for judgment is to live as though you are prepared at all times. So those are kind of the two concepts that I see at work in this chapter. It is a shorter chapter, uh, so that's exciting. A lot of Luke has been kind of long. Uh, so as we dive into Luke 13, where do you want to start? Well, that's kind of hard because I feel like there's certain things that go along with your thread like you're talking, but then there's also some other miracles too that are like, okay, I don't know if it's totally worth completely passing over. Right, that's true. That's fair. Um, something that did just catch my eye even before we got into some of those miracles was uh, Jesus is being asked about people who were essentially killed at the, at the hands of Pilate. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it was interesting just to see Pilate's name in here. Um, So this is like the very first paragraph of chapter 14 or excuse me of 13. Uh, And it says those who came told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Um, and I don't know, it just, just seems really gruesome. And it kind of makes me feel like this is like a whole new layer to Pilate. Um, he is responsible for the, I guess, like punishments of the people who break <laughs> break the rules. And this seems like, I don't know, a scary, no little thing. And to know that he's the same man that decides the fate or helped to decide the fate of Jesus I don't know. It just puts him in a different light. It's interesting that he is the man that will stand face to face with Jesus and be very uncomfortable about judging Jesus and mm-hmm. condemning him to death. He actually washes his hands of it. Um, this story about Pilate, like it shows that he is capable of extreme violence. We don't know a ton about what this is that's happening exactly, but it's very likely um, that these were like extreme kind of political um, revolutionary Galileans, Galileans that were fighting (laughs) against the Romans because a lot of times they would kind of make a protest or take a stand um, in the temple area while they were either approaching to make sacrifices or following making sacrifices. The reason we can say it's fairly likely is because Pilate most likely would not have killed them for no reason. It's possible that he did, but probably they were encouraging some kind of a revolt. And so Pilate just killed them on the spot and their blood ran together with the blood of the sacrifice. I think it's kind of creepy though too that I don't know that that seems like a really twisted part. Like he seems like a really strange twisted individual that would allow something like that to happen to the point where people are talking about it yeah. like ew. Yeah, this this is essentially did. like what would have been in the paper that day. Um what's really interesting if you know anything about the modern Temple Mount, the Al Aska Mosque is there now. Um but it is actually still a place where extreme violence occurs like quickly and without notice. So it's interesting to me that what was happening then continues to happen now. Um, kind of the, the Muslim shrines and mosques are in that area now, but it's still a very tense place. Jenny and I have mm-hmm. had the opportunity of being there. Uh, you can like feel the tension in the mm-hmm. air. And I don't think it's much different. I mean, obviously it is different because the Muslims are there. It used to be the Jews that were there. Um, but the tension part of it is still palpable. And I think it would have been the way then. What's interesting and why he tells this story is these Galileans were not expecting Expecting to be put to death that day. And then he moves into this story about this Tower of Siloam that fell. They were not expecting to be put to death that day. And a lot of people would have assumed that their sins caused their death. But Jesus is kind of making the point that, like, you don't know when your end is coming. And it fits nicely together with that thread that I was talking about. Like, we should be prepared for judgment at all times because we do not know when death is coming. Um, that kind of back in the day became like an overplayed cliche where it was like, do you know where you're going to go if you die? And it was kind of like our favorite way of evangelizing. We've since gotten away from that, I I think. I still see billboards. <laughs> um, but it, it's worth thinking about. Like, it actually is because we should be prepared for judgment at all times. And 
if we have uh, faith in Jesus and we are living a life that reflects that faith in Jesus, we actually don't have anything to be afraid of. We can confidently walk in our identity and know that if we were to die suddenly, uh, say a tower fell on us or say Pilate decided to kill us, uh, we would be confident in um, our saving faith. So I think that's kind of the point of the story. Well, then before we get to the narrow door, because I think there's something else that's important just to go along with that idea, Jesus tells this parable about this fig tree. And again, I think we've heard a similar parable or rendition of this parable yeah, in yeah. Gospels past. <laughs> but um, it's interesting that it gives this, I don't know, like this perspective of grace because this yes. tree is supposed to be cut down because it's not bearing any fruit. But the farmer says, just like, hold on, just give it another year. Let me put manure around it. Let me just see if it bears any fruit. And if not, then you can cut it down. And it just reminds me of this, the grace piece that um, Jesus, he really is like that second chance for most of us. Like, all right, before we just judge everyone to like eternal hell and damnation, like let's give them another shot. Let's send Jesus to do something out of like ultimate grace for them. God is long suffering. God is merciful. God is gracious. Jonah believed that. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. God hasn't changed. God is still long suffering and gracious. Um, he allows us to live pretty long lives where we have a chance to come to a decision, but there is a time when that door closes. Mm -hmm. One interesting extra credit part. This is the Ryan added context, I think. It's <laughs> it's interesting that in verse 7, um, the vine dresser has been watching for this tree to produce fruit for three, three years. years yeah. That is the length of Jesus' ministry, and Jesus is at the end of his ministry. So mm -hmm. it is interesting. I don't know if that's directly correlated or not, but it's interesting that Jesus has been preaching this gospel for three years, and essentially he's saying like, hey, there's no fruit here. I don't, you know, it could be that the parable is teaching exactly that. And the grace that is offered is that fourth year is that like that's when the church grows is in that fourth year when Jesus has already ascended into the heaven and the Holy Spirit indwells um, God's people. So I don't know if that's a thing or not, but I noticed it and I had not noticed it before. Well, I think that's interesting that you mentioned like this this time where the door becomes shut. So this is the, I guess, maybe more of the part that I resonated with the most today, just because I have a lot of questions about it, or it kind of made me feel a little unsettled. Yeah. Um, but this whole section called The Narrow Door, that's the little title it's given in this chapter, verses 22 to 30. There's a part where basically <clears throat> Jesus is teaching that, you know, he's here, He's like teaching everyone. He's dining with them. He's with them constantly. Um, but some of them said to him, um, Lord, will those who be saved be few? And he said, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, and this is what got me, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer, I do not know where you come from. Um, and then they go on to say like, well, we were with you. We we did all these things with you. I think the part that, that really got me, like I said, was um, those who I guess felt like, well, we were there. We were, we wanted to be with you. But once that door is closed, it's not opening again. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that was the part that was most unsettling. And I know that you had found some other references that speak to this a little bit because it's like, to me, there's this, there's this push of, okay, is this because I'm not measuring up? Like <laughs> I believe in God and I'm not measuring up to something, which I know is ridiculous, but those thoughts enter my mind. Or is it that there are people who will never know Jesus or never accept Jesus, even if they know of him or hear of him, but just completely close themselves off to him. These are some of those terrifying passages that are like, wait a minute, like it's scary that yeah. these, these people thought they were followers of Jesus yeah. and they 100% are not. And Jesus is not going to permit them into the kingdom. Here, the master of the house who is God is saying, hey, the door's closed. It's too late for you. Um, and, and I understand why, like, I mean, your actual initial reaction was like, I don't like this passage. It just makes me uncomfortable. Why does it make you uncomfortable? I guess it's like I, I had an idea of like the Titanic, like you think you're on this unsinkable ship. You're great. Yeah. You're great. You're yeah. wonderful. You're good to go. It starts sinking and it's like, nope, you can't get on this boat. There's not enough space. Like, what did I do to miss the mark? Like, I thought I was in the right. I thought I was 
thinking along the right lines and doing what I was supposed to be doing. So I guess it was more or less just like, is it within right relationship with God? And I just like don't meet the marks as I guess that's kind of like more concerned with works or if it's like you knew of who Jesus was, but you never took the time to accept who he was. I think that, I mean, your experience, Jenny, is not uncommon that there are probably people who will like maybe you guys out there listening, maybe you'll read over this passage or you'll listen to us read the passage and it'll make you uncomfortable too. Um, and I, I know of many people who have crises of faith because they come across these passages. There's another passage where it's like Jesus puts the sheep on one side and the goats on the other side and the goats are like, get out of here. I never knew you. And the, the stinging part of the story is always depart from me. I never knew you. And they end up in the place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. So it is like, wait a minute, like what is going on here? And I think the clear thing that's going on here is God knows your heart. He knows who you are. God knows if you are fully committed or not. And judgment occurs based on your authentic commitment, not on your pretend commitment. So like there there are undoubtedly, there are many people who pretend to be faithful followers of Jesus, but are not faithful followers of Jesus. And I think there's... you know, I, I it's can't. just like, where does the grace meter fall out of line? That's so, where I'm like, oh. This is interesting because I think when you come to authentic saving faith in Jesus, you're saved. You don't have to read this passage and be scared. So if you have full faith in the fact that Jesus has died for your sin, he's conquered your sin, he's paid the debt for your sin, his resurrection conquered death, he made you in his uh, resurrection a new man, a new woman, you have a new life in Christ, you're saved. You're not going to be somebody who is told to depart. The other thing to think about is how are you living your life? And I would say that when you come to authentic faith in Jesus, your life automatically necessarily changes because you are going to start to walk in the good things that God has planned for you beforehand. When you come to Jesus in authentic faith, you will produce fruit. And hear these stories like this this fig tree story is like, well, that tree is not bearing any fruit. It's going to get cut down. Um, I think that is true of people who are not authentic followers of Jesus. If you are not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance in following Christ, you should read this passage and be concerned. And I'm not saying that you should work to be a better person. I'm saying that you should work to be, well, not work, but like you should believe Jesus, and you should allow Jesus to transform who you are. And many of us have been told for a long time that if you just pray a magic prayer, you'll be permitted. But the problem is that magic prayer is nowhere in scripture. There's nowhere that says, hey, just like believe this one thing. I guess you could make the case there's a passage that says, if you um, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord. Uh, I, I, I think the rest of the passage is essentially to the effect of like, you will be saved. Um but belief is really important. Like when you believe something, you act on it. So I think many, especially in Western American churches, have been sold this cheap grace, this cheap discipleship that actually does no transformation because you're not actually following Jesus. These are the people that are in this crowd that are being cast out. Because you'll notice the thing that shocks all of them is that like they were hanging out with him. They were with him. Mm -hmm. um, they began to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Notice none of this is about the transformation of their own lives. Yeah, it's just like we were around you. We talked about exactly. you. Exactly. All, cool oh, all they're doing is appealing to their actual proximity. Like I ate and drank with you, Jesus. I, I heard you in my streets. That doesn't mean that you actually experienced anything. It doesn't mean you believed in him. It doesn't mean you followed him. It just means you were close to him. And essentially what, what I read from this passage and I don't want to communicate too hard, I guess, but like just going to church is not going to do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Just being in a building where they sing cool worship songs and do whatever else Feels doesn't good. necessarily mean anything. Um, what does mean something is when you come to a place of authentic faith, you allow Jesus to change who you are. The Holy Spirit works in your life and you become obedient. I know that we are saved by faith alone and not by works, but when we are saved by faith alone, we produce fruit and those look like works. So it's kind of complicated. Sometimes it's a little bit, um, I don't know, thought provoking, I guess. But I don't think like if you, if you read this passage and you are authentically following Jesus, that means you believe that he has provided for your salvation and you are making decisions according to his commandments. I don't think you have anything to worry about. I think that I don't want to come across as having like a really frail faith or 
right. something that's right. easily broken. But it is something that I read, and I'm like, whoa, I hope that's not me. Because, <laughs> like, I think there's parts of it where I resonate, not necessarily with, like, well, I did the church thing, and I did that. It's just, like, well, I'm, I'm definitely trying to strive to do what the Bible says, but if there would be something that I missed the mark on, that would be, like... A Crushing. bummer. So the other passages we were, uh, you alluded to earlier, and then I got wound up and didn't actually hit on them. John six thirty seven <laughs> says, uh, Jesus is speaking, says, whoever comes to me will not be cast out. So he's saying, mm-hmm. like, when you authentically approach me and accept me and believe in me, you will not be cast out. And then John fourteen six says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, just like a doorway. Like, when you approach God through Jesus, you are accepted, you are permitted, you are welcomed. Um, the the other thing, I guess two things, like one, we don't want to be living to minimally honor Christ. Like you don't, yeah, yeah. you, you don't want to be asking Jesus, like, what's the least thing I can do and still make it? That's, that's not good. Like if you're living that way, it makes sense that you would be concerned. You want to be reading God's word and saying like, what can I do to be close to Jesus and do exactly what he says? That's what you want. So as we're thinking about this thread through chapter 13, I feel like there's a lot of different directions that you could go, but I think that common thread that we've been talking about of just being prepared and being ready so that we don't find ourselves in these places of being like the fig tree or worrying about this narrow door, I think there's like some pretty good application for your part for today. I would say there's there's two parts of this. One is concern and one is confidence. So one is like, Let's all be concerned. Let's examine our relationship with mm-hmm. Christ. Let's actually examine the fruits in our lives. Like, what are we, what evidence in our lives is there of the fact that we are following Jesus? If there's very little or almost none, then probably there's some room for growth. And I would encourage you to pursue growth. But the other thing I would say is confidence. Like, if you do truly believe Jesus for your salvation, And you look at your life and you're like, you know what? I actually make a lot of decisions according to Jesus' actual commands. I would encourage you to find confidence. Like read this passage and be like, man, I'm so happy that I'm actually already in. Thanks for joining us today for chapter 13. Hopefully you found a couple little things that you can apply to your own life today and hopefully grow in your confidence and your faith in Christ. We'll be back again tomorrow with Luke chapter 14. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Luke chapter 13. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galilean, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans, because they were suffering in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for eighteen years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And as he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all these adversaries were put to shame, 
and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, therefore, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, To whom shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, until it was all leavened. He went on his way through the towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer to you, I did not know you or where you came from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some of the first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem! the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.